What we're going to do today is tonight, we're going to talk about how to use Decoder Pro. This clinic is going to be targeted to the people who have Decoder Pro set up and running on their computer. I'm not going to talk about how to do that tonight. It's not all that difficult, but sometimes it can be a little bit tricky. But if you just go through the steps that are on the JMRI website for your particular DCC system, you'll get it up and running. What you do need to run Decoder Pro is you need some kind of a computer to DCC interface. Some of the DCC systems provide that. It's already built into it. And some of them you have to buy something like this little card right here. Okay. And this card is the NCE USB to uh, DCC interface card. So this small black cable on it connects up to the to my power cab and then this side is connected to my computer and it's that simple okay so first let's talk about what decoder pro is decoder pro is a graphic user interface to programming decoders it's part of a whole suite of tools called JMRI. Tonight, we're only going to talk about Decoder Pro. And if you've ever programmed a decoder using the CVs, you know that you have to know the CV, you have to know the, the, the values that can or cannot be used. Many of them won't even accept certain values. Some of them will accept only a very small, limited number. So way back when, when JMRI was first invented, it was invented to do Decoder Pro first. And there's a, a definition for every decoder that is currently available or has ever been available in Decoder Pro that customizes the screens for that decoder. That's magic. Because now, instead of having to know what is the CV number and what is the what are the possible values, all you do is open up Decoder Pro and it gives it to you in names like, what is the address? It says address, locomotive address in it. Right, instead of having to know that the address is on CV1 or even worse, 17 and 18, right? You just fill in the blanks, okay? Or in the case of volume, you slide a slider or other kinds, it's select from a list, et cetera. And I'm going to show you how that works. And we're going to start right out with that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go launch Decoder Pro. So I just double-click on it, and it opens up. And up here in the top left, we have New Loco, and we have Identify. So if you've already worked on it with Decoder Pro, you use Identify, or you can just click on New Loco, and it will tell you what kind of decoder is in it. It'll find out what the decoder is that's in the model, Right. And then sometimes it gives you a list and you have to pick from a list, but it's not difficult. So I'm just going to go to identify. So it's going through and checking the programming track. So now I'm just going to open that particular decoder. I'm going to slip this down so that I can see it without seeing that stuff that zoom stuff at the top okay now i'm i'm gonna go ahead here um so right here across the top you see all these tabs that are up here right 
And I'm just going to click on a few of those. Notice the first one that comes up on is roster entry. And then we have basic. That's all the basic stuff about every decoder that you have, right? There's a motor, motor section, speed control, speed table, sound, et cetera, right? So one of the most important parts of Decoder Pro is that it not only allows you to program, but it also allows you to save what your program, what you program for that local motor and put it in something that calls a roster entry. So right here, I have a little button that says save to roster, right? If I click that, it's going to take whatever it's got in there now and put it put it off in the roster entry. And because I just opened it up, it's just going to save back what was in there before. So the first thing that I want to do on a new locomotive is I want to go and click down here. You see it says read all sheets, right? The tabs are the sheets. And so if I click on read all sheets, it's going to start reading them. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see the CV number that it's currently reading. See that down there where it's changing right there in the bottom line right here? Anybody want to look at CV number reference? <laughs> you don't okay. need to. With your right. Right. With Decoder Pro, you don't need uh, to know what the CVs are. But what it's doing is reading them and putting them into this on-screen version of the roster entry. What? Where did you start to get to this particular window? Here? At the bottom of this page, I have to shift it up so I can see it. You see that down there at the bottom? See the blue... Uh, it currently says stop, read all sheets. It said read all sheets before. So it's reading every single CV on the, on the decoder. And what the setting is. Right. So I'm going to go ahead. It'll, let's see, what number is it up to? Yeah, it's it, it's actually getting close. And it knows all of those fancy kinds of CV. Have you ever done a sound decoder and you had to do indexed CVs and you had to start with what the index main index number is and all the sub numbers were right here. It was reading 16.1.204, right? Uh, there are sound decoders out there that have 1,200 CVs. That's 1,200 different things. A lot of them are related to each other. But that doesn't matter, okay? And actually, what you're going to find out, hopefully by the end of the night, is that even programming sound is really easy on Decoder Pro. I'm going to start here on the roster entry page, and I'm going to tell you what my procedure is. If you notice up here at the top where it says ID, and I have a very complicated number there, that's underscore GN underscore 177 underscore NW3. That's my name, what railroad it is, what the locomotive number is, and what locomotive type is. And the DP stands for division point. That's the way you do it. Right? That's the way I do it. You can use any name in there. I recommend that you use a relatively complex name. You can put them in any order that you think is important, but I think you're going to find out that you're more interested in that. The reason my name is on there is because my roster is full of entries from about 100 different people because I work on other people's locomotives all the time. So I always put their name on the front of it so that I know that I'm working on John's instead of mine. Then you also, again, fill in the road name, the road number, right? 
who made it, division point, right? Owner, model, et cetera, right? And then when I'm done with that, I could click on save to roster. And that would put that out there. But before I want to save it to the roster, I'd like to know what's in this particular decoder. So I would go to read all sheets and I would read everything in there. And then I just immediately do a save to create a roster entry for that locomotive from then on. But one of the basic things that you do is to set the address, right? So I just go in here and fill in the blank. And I will give you my procedure for how I set the address. First, I always set the address to the address of the locomotive. That works. There are, quote, 10,000 possible addresses, right? Because four digits. There's only one address that I never set in the locomotive, and that's three. And the reason for that, if you ever had to do a reset on one of your decoders, you know that it always resets it to address three. So this particular locomotive has an address. It has a, a number on it of 177. So I've set 177 in here for the extended address. That's the long address. And I set 77 for the short address. Now, why do I do that? Because every once in a while, rarely, but it's important to know when it did happen, your decoder will go through what I call a spontaneous reset. It'll reset itself, and you won't know it happened. But if you put the short address of 77 in here, if this one resets, I'll know because during the reset, it'll go to three. And then I'll say, oh, I know what happened to that. And here's one of the real powers of Decoder Pro. I can bring up the roster entry out of my roster list, right? And I can reprogram this decoder back to where it was before. There are very few conditions where spontaneous reset happens. And in general, if it happens on one of your locomotives, you need to be looking at uh, your procedures, for that and also possibly also the decoder that's in it. Some decoders are much more prone to doing spontaneous resets than others. And they usually occur when the locomotive has been seeing a, a short with the circuit breaker retrying, saying, is the short cleared yet? Is the short cleared yet? And with some decoders, that time that it comes back up, it sees that just long enough to say, oh, I'm going to reset. The decoder sees that power, and it, it's confused about what its address is. Okay, so I just go in and I set the address. Um, you can choose your own speed step mode. I use 28 slash 128 for everything. But that's my preferences. I'll try and point all of those out as I go along. Okay, so now I'm going to recap. You bring up the locomotive. You do a read all sheets. You set the address. You set the roster entry, the ID, right? And now you know what's in there. Do a save to roster. Now go in and program at will because you can always set it right back to here with its new address, with its the, what I call the real address, the one you want, which is what's on the locomotive, the number on the locomotive, you want that address. You don't want it to be at three. And you can bring up the roster entry and rewrite the decoder and get it right back to where it was the first time. Or... If you make any important changes, let's say you did a programming session, you went through and you set up the speed to operate the way you want to, and you set up the sound, et cetera, right? Do a save for roster. Don't just close it down, save it, right? That way you can you don't lose that work. 
I don't. Some guys I know recommend doing a save to roster quote all the time. I don't. I do it once a session, but I'm disciplined about it. If I made even a single change, and by the way, if I went to close this right now, if I had made a change to it anywhere, Decoder Pro saw that, and it says, "Do you want to save the changes?" Wow. Right. Sometimes I've been in, I've been looking at a decoder, right? I haven't made any changes that I know of, right? And I go to close it and work on a different locomotive. And guess what? It says, do you want to save the changes? I go, whoa, no way, <laughs> right? And also, that's a time when I might want to consider closing it down, bringing it back up, and then doing a, a read all sheets or even better, a write all sheets rewrite everything on it to get it back because something happened during that session and i don't know there is a way to check i'll show you how to do that there's a one of the sheets up here is cvs you see that and if i click on that now what i get is all the c num cvs and their current number and here in the status in the, you know, it tells you what has happened to it. Is it read it? Did it get it from a file, et cetera, right? And this, it's color coded too. Like if I go in and change this one to 88, right? And I do a write. Now I just updated it and it shows stored. I'm going to put it back to 77. Okay. Um, so we got the Decoder Pro entry, Gloucester entry, right? And we have one for every one of our locomotives. And if you're new to Decoder Pro and you're just getting started, one of the best things you can do is to take all your locomotives, put them on the programming track one at a time, do a read-all sheets, and create a roster entry. That gets you to a base level. Okay. Um, questions? I've got one little moment. It's, it's number three. So is there a way you can put that in there, like zero, three, or something? Okay. I recommend you make up your own way that you're going to do that. But I would probably set that locomotive to something like 33 or maybe 103, uh, something other than three, okay? But something that ends in three that doesn't conflict with, if you know, if you're a Santa Fe modeler, there are certain numbers series that you want to reserve for your locomotives because Santa Fe uses those numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I also seriously consider if it if it's wearing number three, putting a decal on the locomotive and setting the decoder to something other than three. Three's the default. I know. I yeah. yeah, and it's 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 an industry wide default, right? So I would I would recommend getting out your decals to be honest as the best solution. But you want all of your locomotives to have a unique number. So you can write it on a sticker or something on the box. Yes. In fact, I know guys that do that. Uh they, you know, they'll set like like three, 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 and then they'll write it right on the bottom on the on the bottom of the fuel tank or wherever, someplace on the bottom, they'll say address, you know, DCC address. Yeah. yeah. It's it's fine, you know, put a little piece of tape on the bottom of it and write on the tape. The only other thing that I really have to cover is what computer do you use? I it it supports Windows, it supports Apple, it supports uh Unix, you know, et cetera, Linux, all of those there. The Gemini runs under all of those. Some of them. You know, Windows and Apple, it's really easy because 
all the things that you need to do to get the hardware talking are all well understood. And so that's a pretty easy thing. Oh, one last thing. I mentioned at the start, the Jamrise is a suite of tools, right? Decoder Pro is just one of those tools. If you're only using Jamrise for Decoder Pro and not using things like Panel Pro and Operations and et cetera, go to the latest test version of Jamrise and get that, download that, and use that and update it every six months or, or a year. Or if you go out and buy the very latest locomotive, usually the definition is in Decoder Pro before you even get it home. The manufacturers don't do that. There are guys all over the world who are dedicating their time and donating it to you to do the definitions for all the new decoders that are showing up. There are guys out there who are, you know, they've already programmed in the new NCE command station. You can't even, you know, you can't go see one. Has anybody seen one? I sure haven't. I've seen it. I've seen it on YouTube, but I haven't seen the actual one, you know, in my hands. That's how new it is. Well, it's already in Dakota. How much does JMI cost? Free. 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 The, <laughs> the, this interface card that you might need, depending on your DCC system, is the only thing that might cost you some money and maybe a cable. The Sprog, the Sprog is a, a very good standalone uh, programming use, okay? I'm an NCE guy, so I have an NCE power cab, and uh, I find it's gorgeous because I can have a separate, all I need is another programming cab panel, the PCP that's on the end here, okay? All I need is one of those, and now I have a standalone programming track, or I can, you know, leave it permanently connected to the layout. I actually just commute my power cab itself because on the layout it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a uh, power pro. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, it's just a pro cab, and it converts. <laughs> uh, so it's. We need to use this return Alex and stuff like that. Like you came on. Yes. And uh, if you're so inclined, you could go to LCC and use it to program your LCC modules. Uh, the people, nodes. People interface it with uh, Arduino. Um, there is some interface to Arduino, but not really because Arduino isn't. Arduino is hardware only and hardware programming only. But if you have an Arduino to DCC interface, then you can do whatever you could do under DCC. I, I do a lot of Arduino. My Arduino is not connected to the other training on the price of the third. Yeah. You just power them up and complete the different unit. That is my service. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think you can. You just did like the Raspberry Pi or something. They connect the majority of the. No, there is a, a DCC library. We can actually inspire DCC library. And they talk about DCC. Right. I think I've covered all the general stuff and the basics and the how to. So now I'm going to give you some tips and tricks that will make your life easier for me. These are my preferred methods. Okay, first, I use a speed table for everything. Notice the shape of this speed table. It's a steep start, and then a very gentle, and doesn't go all the way to the top speed. This locomotive will reach a maximum speed of about 30 scale miles per hour. The part at the front between the first speed range and the second one, notice that that's steep, right? And that's there 
get the locomotive over that starting point. And then from there on, it's all very gentle. There's also a start voltage setting. The start voltage is a different setting. Okay, that's the basic speed control. That's over here. That's not used when you're using the speed table. Some decoders do pay attention to start voltage even with the speed table. Most don't. It's a setting. Yeah. Right. Let me show you how easy it is to set up this shape. So first, over here on this side, if you can see, it, notice it says 119. And then over here, it's at zero, and then it goes to 15, right? So what I'm going to do, watch what happens when I shift this down. See how that moved all of them? That's Decoder Pro doing that for you. Yeah, normally okay. you have to go 25 different key strokes on the programming yeah. buttons, you know, on your right. whatever system on you would. Okay. Well, I'm going to take this one. I'm going to drag it up. Okay. I have to get a hold of it. I'm having there. None of them move. Why was that? Because that movement that I did the other way when I went slower, right? It drugged them all down because you don't want a decoder that goes up and then goes down. You want to be ever increasing towards the right. So now I'm gonna slam this all the way to the bottom. I there. Okay. So now everything's at zero. So how do I put this back to the way it was before. And that's also how I program my speed tables. The first thing I do is I take this one and I set it to the value that I want it to be. In this case, it was 119, right? So I've got it about 111 now, okay? I can even change this right there. Oop. Where is that number changing like that? It's right here. Right. So I set that one to 119. Now I'm going to take this leftmost side and I'm going to take it up and notice that when it's less than the guys to the right of it, they shift up, right? And I'm watching the value in this second range. But here I have a button called match ends, right? So what it's going to do is it's going to watch watch how it changes when I click that, zip, right? This one isn't at 11 anymore. It's at 8. So I'm going to go up a little bit with that until I get that on 11. Does that represent speed, that number? No, it's a CV setting of relative speed. Right. It's a value. Yeah, so there's 28 different CVs that we would have to program individually from 0 to 255 to set that logarithmic table. Mm -hmm. And if you were to do what Jim just did manually, like on a Digi tracks control station or even like a hammerhead or something, it takes him four hours. Yeah, he did, he did it in four seconds. Okay. Yeah, and it's just it's just controlling that all each one of those individual settings so that every step it's going to you know increase this incrementally to the next speed. Well, this is beautiful because I have skipped those because I think I understand it. Okay, so I'll be able to go back and the upper speed is water. I mean, there are days. Right. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And then what I further do is then after I've got all my locomotives captured, then I actually speed match them 
using this table. Because every motor is a little bit different. Every motor and gear system, even two copies of the same model will not run identical with the same decoder and the same manufacture date. But when they speed, man, where do you do that? I have this set up where I can see the layout. I have two parallel tracks. I run them, I put them in a consist, and I run them one on each track at the same time. And I slow down the one that I want slower and I speed up the one I want faster right. until I get them right. Okay. It's a process. You have to try yeah. it. It sounds complicated, but for those of you that have never done this, let me tell you that I speed match locomotives at the rate of four to six an hour. Most guys will tell you it took me three hours to do just two. Yeah. And that's true for the first ones. But then you learn the process and you learn how to adjust and you, you know, you're, you're, you make better guesses. <laughs> Is the default uh, speed table for most decoders? No, most decoders default to the basic which is the three step this is the 28 step slow yeah, have to tell medium the, and high tell the decoder it's for speed to the it's right. not default to the that was back here on basic here it says um right here let's see speed steps yeah okay and i can pick from the list, it's a good example. Um, and then if I go to basic speed control, uh, most of Decoder Pro, you just read what's on the page and you'll understand it. So one of the things I've done when setting the speed table is rather than having a Somewhat linear as what your profile is to 28 steps. I take it up to what I want the max to it and I flatten out the steps. So I, bring, I don't have to go to 28 steps to get to 30 right. miles an hour. And, the max is. and I've done that also. Okay. For instance, on locomotives that are just switchers, yeah. I set them to get up to 30 and I speed, speed match the first 30 miles per hour scale 30. Okay. And then the rest of it, I set it level. That's the way the real locomotives behave. They won't go any faster than 30, but they'll match to a locomotive they might be coupled up to, up to there. So, you know, that that's a, a good solution, and I use that also. That speed cable, is that the same as the 28, 128? That's on the yeah. Not really. That's speed mode. And that's how many steps it'll take you yeah. from zero to full speed. Right. It's this button right here that says I'm using the speed table. Yeah. Okay. If I go over to basic, I can say, don't use speed table, use this. Right. And if I click that one, you know, then this speed table isn't working anymore. See, it's not set. So I'll set it back there. Okay, now, the next one is motor, and specifically momentum. Okay. And I recognize, and I'm going to admit up front, that this is a controversial topic that a lot of people have very strong opinions about how it should or shouldn't be done. I'm just going to tell you what I do. First, I try to speed match everything, even steam to diesel, but especially steam to steam. But with steam, I break it up into switchers, road locomotives, you know, road switchers, et cetera. I kind of have three different grades. And, um, If you're speed matching, you have to have the same momentum 
in all of the locomotives. Now, the simple thing is, oh, just set it to zero. And that's true. But what I like to do is to set the acceleration rate three times slower than the D cell. So mine right here, this one is 30 and 90, right? 30 for D cell and 90 for acceleration. That means if somebody is running your locomotive and they rip the throttle all the way to the top, it's not gonna speed up right away. It's gonna be slow. And it'll take them a while to get used to it if they've never done a locomotive with momentum. But what it does, what the momentum does is it slows down the response to speed changes. It's that simple. So why don't I just use 90 and 90? Because I found out that the guys in the club were overrunning where they wanted to stop. So I use 30 and 90. Because at 30, this is on a tsunami decoder, okay? At 30, you rip it to zero and it stops pretty darn quick. But it's still not instant. And that helps make it behave more prototypically. That's kind of a loaded word. So I'm gonna say it, it behaves slower, it behaves more like when you get outside tonight and you get in your car, you don't stomp on the throttle as you're backing out of the slot, right? You touch it. You don't know this group very <laughs> well. What can I say? So this is a more precise than the momentum button on the yeah. I hate the NCE momentum button. You know why? No, why? Because it changes the decoder. Yes. It's the stupidest thing NCA ever did. They never should have done that. And I know guys who go in and put tape behind the, the button in the back of the, you know, inside the throttle so that you can't use the momentum buttons. Okay. It reprograms the locomotive instantly, right now. Boom. Okay. And it, well, when you hit the momentum button, it says, what value do you want to use? And gives you a range of, I don't know, zero to nine, something like that. Okay. It just sets a value in there. I don't even know what value it translates to. Right. Because I don't ever use it. But I think NC is the only one that has a momentum value right on the cap. Cool. Um, okay, so okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sound and actually about sound levels. Do what you want to do for your locomotives, right? For me, all the cute stuff, the engineer chatter, you know, the the conductor saying all aboard, et cetera, okay? All that cute stuff, I just slam it to zero, right? Remember I talked about sliders? So each of these is a slider. And I can pick this up and slide it left and right if I can get my pointer right on it. Okay. And I can get that there. Okay. Um, the other thing that I pay a lot of attention to is relative volumes. What's the loudest noise on a locomotive? The horn. What's close to the second louds, the bell. Almost all sound decoders that where you buy a locomotive has already got a sound decoder in it. They've got the volumes way too high. So I tone them down, right? 
I use the 10 foot rule. If I'm working in a yard and there's track coming at me from the main line out here to my right, I want to notice that train when it's about 10 feet away. If I stop and listen for it, I should be able to hit, hear it just about anywhere in the layout room. Unless there's a bunch of guys talking. That never happens to you guys, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, when it's 10 feet away and coming at me, I want to start hearing it so that I can start being ready for there's something coming. I need to do something. It's sort of like looking around the room. It also means that the overall volume of the chuff or the diesel sound is low enough that it's not annoying. Also, if it's on the other end of the room, if I'm not hearing that guy, he's in another country, you know, certainly in another state. And that's where I want him to be because he's not in my part of the layout. Um, there are some sounds that are they can be really annoying right you got a steam locomotive you can have if you turn the lights on you can have the the, the generator come on right if you got that set too high, it's just damned annoying is all. Just whines, right? If you're there on a quiet day next to the Durango and Silverton, do you hear the generator if it's on? Absolutely, right? Especially if you're standing next to the locomotive. If you're back in the cars, no, you don't hear it, right? If it's coming around the corner and it's a half a mile away, do you hear it? No, okay? Do you see the light? Yeah. Can you tell the class lights are on? Maybe. Further away it is, the less likely. So I make my class lights dimmer than my headlight. Uh, uh, you probably. Okay, go ahead. The very latest one that came out, the test version. No, this is like 5.7.23. Actually, this one is 5.52. Okay, so JMRI stands for Java Model Railroad Interface. So it's based on Java. And so it, every once in a while, they upgrade to a different version of Java that they support. I recommend getting uh, version 11 of Java and getting the latest Decoder Pro that you can get, get the test version off of the JMRI website, install that. I ran into that when I was trying to load it up. Anyway, I tried the new Decoder Pro. Yeah. And but at first I upgraded to have a little only bit, put it up to 8.4. And then it says, you want to try to use Decoder Pro, you know, and I tried to upgrade when you know, it says, no, your computer is using. Uh, yes. Okay. Right. So, so the answer to that dilemma is you have to get Java from somebody other than Oracle. Wait, I mean, the reality is it doesn't matter. It works. It works with an old Windows 7 computer, like 20 years old, and I have an old JMI with Java. On there and something, whatever it is, right. it's old. So on the JMRI website, you can roll back as far as you need to go to be compatible with whatever version you're using or whatever operating system you're using. 
You don't have you don't have to have a radius because it matters. You just make sure it's compatible with what you're using. Right. So I can question if it's like that's one of my my brain damn math is that limits. So I should really be able to map the latest to the first problem. And then by latest, when you can get probably a good version of Linux that work, I mean, the job that I would, okay. Yeah. So well, I'll help you with that. I don't know the particulars, but I can I can give you the general general thing, okay? Mm -hmm. If you're going to go to the latest version of GMRI, so you can run the latest version of G Decoder Pro, then you probably want Java 11. I don't know how you set up for Java 11 on your on that system on a, on a Linux box, okay? but but you want to get that, and you may not be able to get that from Oracle. No, Oracle owns the license to Java, but they also license out to other companies that build up a version, you know, that they that they support. I think that the Oracle version is now at like version 21. But you have to pay for it. <laughs> the last the highest one they give away without any special things is eight. But that's because there's all these other companies that are doing all those interim releases. And sometimes it matters. Okay. Um, so sound. Pay attention to your relative sounds, right? And in fact, the way I do them is I literally program the decoder and then I go in why isn't that? Oh, it's in programming. That's fine. Um, anyway, I write them right directly to the locomotive and then test them right there. You know, on my test track. Uh, I can't do it right now. That's, that's something that Scrog is good for. You yeah, switch between running and yeah. Well, I can too, but I've got this. The I've got Decoder Pro running in a mode where it doesn't switch back and forth. Yeah, it does yeah. everything. Yeah, I've had one of you. Too. Yeah, I'm lost. Sprog takes the place of one of those uh, interface cards. Yes, this thing. Uh, Sprog actually takes the place of a DCC system with an interface card. So it's just a you know, module USB connection to a computer and then uh, track costs and power for the score. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. it. If you're an HO, a Sprog will work fine. Okay. If you're in a larger scale, uh, you might find that the Sprog doesn't have enough power to support running locomotives. The Sprogs are still like 100 bucks. I don't know. I haven't had my own time. My own time, too. Yeah. They were about a hundred bucks. Yeah. Then you know, they he probably bought like the most recent. I have seen it. I've seen it. I was old, but put it in there. Anybody here on Digitrax? And older Digitrax or new? Uh, 210 plus. Um, you mean by older versus new? Which? Um, uh, do you have like a 240 station? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, then then you will need a uh, some kind of interface. Yeah, yeah. I find a very good network, not happy. But it's really yeah, touchy. Yeah, yeah. That's the reason I went to NCE. I got tired of all the things that didn't work right in Digitrax. But that's that's me. Okay, I know guys who have stayed with Digitrax forever. And they're perfectly happy. Um, okay. Next thing I'm going to talk about for sound locomotives is the equalizer. 
if you look at this shape, you'll notice that I have this funny shape here. Okay. Actually, what I normally do is this. Pick that one up and set it all the way to zero. That's the low end. Guess what? Our decoders don't produce low end sound. And then I have this curve that's sort of like a big cup. And that's to emphasize the low and the highs and to de-emphasize the middles, which makes it sound pretty darn good. Most sound decoders support a equalizer. You can see that I use almost no reverb. I think reverb makes a lot of sense for the bell. And maybe if you're trying to simulate a, a double motor diesel, but other than that, it doesn't make much sense. So, but the bell, I have the horn and the bell have a little bit of reverb in it. And the rest of it's pretty much zero. What she was that? It's yeah. the it's the reverb sheet. Oh, reverb. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Um. Anybody else have any new questions? Anybody here who isn't using Decoder Pro who thinks maybe I'm going to go home and try this? I hope. Good. I do have one more question. Sure. We're still working on the shots. Right. I just uh, kind of talked to the folks at Tell. This one that has been beached the river revolution, so I said it. So, that's not a way to get it to separate. What decoder is in? What decoder is in? So, it's a tsunami. It's the tsunami. Okay, if it's a tsunami, yes, you can set it. We just have to. It could be like a like a low cost tsunami, but you should be able to set the tuck rate. Mm -hmm. So it's on. It's on here. You go to your sound. Oh, I tell you, sound. It's not a pistol well over here. Okay. But you basically have to set. The chuck rate and the sound settings for the revolution of the, you know, one of the wheels. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to run it and see if it matches up. And then if it doesn't, then you've got to either adjust down or adjust up in the street. That's going to make the scene different. Yeah. Right. It takes, it, sometimes it takes a lot. You can drive you nuts. You have to have me. Yeah. You can drive you nuts. Yeah, but then you can sit there and look locomotives not moving, and then you'll be going around. They work great. So, um, I think we're done with the formal part of the clinic, unless there's something that I didn't cover that you thought I was going to. Um, I hope that. Most of you did. Uh, you know, it's Decoder Pro is easy. And uh, I'll use it. I, I've done hundreds of locomotives. Are we done? Did you close? Yes. Okay, good. So. Um, All right, let me hold on. Maybe oh. So for you guys online, do you guys have any specific questions? Okay. okay. Appreciate, Appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to stop recording now.